So thank you, everybody, for coming out on this lovely um, day. It's warm, but it's a little rainy. Anyway, um, this um, we're really pleased to have uh, both Itzel and Lloyd here to talk to you about um, current uh, issues with immigration in our country. As we know, this is a very um, sensitive and important issue. Um, it's unfortunate that um, it's been turned into a divisive kind of an issue. So we're going to be very careful to not get too um, political, but we have to talk about um, what's important in terms of human rights. I really just wanted to say, too, that even though um, the polls suggest that two um, to one Americans in this country actually do believe that immigrants strengthen our community. But these people are not necessarily always on the forefront of making their voices heard. So this is one of the things we hope to accomplish with this program tonight, is that we'll all learn something we didn't know when we came in, and we'll leave with some ideas and plans of what we can do to help uh, our, our family, our fellow citizens and neighbors and friends. So um, we have with us Itzel Perez Hernandez. So Itzel is um, born in Mexico, but came here at the age of 10. And because of that, she is um, <coughs> protected under the DACA program. For those of you who don't know, it refers to Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. So young people who were brought here as children uh, by their parents and are not necessarily documented have certain legal status under the law. And Itzel can tell you more about that because some of that is now in danger. Um, but since Itzel has um, been here, she has made herself into a uh, kind of a force of nature in the community. She graduated Red Bank Regional High School and New Jersey City University with a degree in national security and political scientist, and she's no nonsense. Every question you want to know about immigration, today, yesterday, and tomorrow, <laughs> she'll probably know it. Um, she's um, well known by our legislatures here in New Jersey and in Washington. She works as an organizer for the American Friends Service Committee. The American Friends um, is um, part of the Quaker Society. And that basically means she helps to monitor immigration policy at both at the local, state, and national levels. She's also part of a local group called the Awakened Community. And then we have Lloyd Munchak here, who is a lawyer from Queens, he told me to tell you. Um, but now he's here in Red Bank where, um, you know, God's country. Anyway. Um, Lloyd has been a lawyer since 1987. He started private practice in Queens. He worked for the federal government um, in the INS, which is the used to be um, Immigration and Naturalization Services for five years, and um, in immigration services actually for your whole career, correct? Yeah. Um, he's provided legal services for uh, women and children in detention centers, and also um, works with the American Friends Service Committee, and I would venture to say knows um, this issue inside and out. So we're going to let them present, um, and then we'd like to afterwards open for questions and comments. So thank, you. thank you very much. Um, I guess I'm going to start out tonight and uh, just say thank you to the library and uh, to Linda and to Patty and Julie, who I just met tonight, and to all of you for coming and spending your time and listening to us. So I, uh, this morning I sat down um, 
I took a break from the work and said, okay, let me write something out for tonight. And I think I actually wrote, uh, I could probably publish, I think I wrote like a basically a manuscript of a book. <laughs> I apologize if I go on too long. I'm not sure the best way to handle this, uh, but I'll, there's a lot of information and uh, I don't pretend to have everything memorized. So uh, I'm going to kind of see if I can touch on uh, the, 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 the most uh, important kind of information that I have. And again, I'm going to try to stay away from being political, as was mentioned, although it's kind of hard, I have to say, to deal with this topic and this information. It's such a charged um, and just a, just a highly emotional um, issue for everybody. But uh, I'm, I'm just coming from where, where I'm coming from, and it's based on my experience of, uh, I guess, over 30 years of practicing immigration law. And uh, as Petty mentioned, I started, well, I started out um, as a prosecutor for what was then the Immigration and Naturalization Service, which is now, after 9-11, you know, it was broken, it changed from Department of Justice to Homeland Security, which was a new agency, and got separated into uh, ICE, which is the enforcement part, and CIS, which is Citizenship and Immigration Services. They do the adjudications of petitions and uh, applications. And, uh, uh, and uh, CB, you know, Border Patrol. CBP, they call it. And uh, the other piece to that is there's the immigration courts as well, which, they, which is the executive office of immigration review. Um, then I went on to be in private practice for uh, around 15 years in Queens, where I'm from, and uh, ultimately ended up in Texas for about seven years. Um, after the divorce, came back to New York and uh, ended up uh, with the American friends. Where I'm, I'm with them for about five years. And so my entire life, I've been my, my career has been, uh, you know, immigration law, um, with the exception of four years driving a yellow cab in, in New York City, which I think I learned a lot doing that too. So. <laughs> All right, so uh, yeah, again, American Friends Service Committee. Who are we? Uh, the Friends. Some of you might have heard of the Friends. Uh, it's 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 a it's the kind of the political arm of the Quakers. And uh, who are the Quakers? Uh, it's a, it's a Quakers are a form of, uh, it's a religion that's based on, it's, 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 it's a Christian religion, and uh, it was started in England, and uh, they have some uh, very strong beliefs, particularly uh, pacifism is, uh, is, a, is a very strong um, tenet that runs throughout Quakerism. Now, the workers, uh, you know, the staff, we're not all Quakers, but uh, our, uh, uh, our beliefs, you know, will coincide with the beliefs of the Quakers. So pacifism is a big one. Uh, you know, integrity of, of the individual, equality, uh, simplicity, uh, you know, stewardship of the earth. Those are the those are the main values of the Quakers. That's the main values that that we we as American Friends Service Committee try to um, portray in, in our actions. Okay, so um, I'm going to just start right into the information. I think it was billed as immigration under the Trump administration. Under the current. Under the current administration. Okay. <laughs> 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 I'm getting political already. <laughs> um, so, you know, again, 32 years of doing this, and it, it's kind of like, okay, practicing immigration law, and then it's just like, I don't know, whatever direction you want to take. Just, it's, we're, we're in a totally different space. Uh, the last few years than I've ever seen in my life, and so there's, there's, a, there's a whole slew of changes. Um, we'll start with, you know, I don't even know where to start, but I, I'm going to start with uh, some of the most publicized issues. Right now you have uh, policies uh, of the government uh, that are designed by the administration to, uh, let's face it, to basically stop immigration. And to make, I think that they've served um, as a way uh, to make life miserable to a large, you know, population of, of individuals who are both legal uh, people who are have uh, an immigration status and those who are seeking immigration status. For example, through the political asylum process, um, and it's it's worked. I mean, it's really worked. I've seen it in my own uh, experience, and uh, I, I, I it's. They, the, the administration is relentless, and they are very determined, and um, they are making life miserable for, uh, for, for, for many, many people 
and for their attorneys as well. Um, so the first thing I wanted to talk about, and I don't want to uh, go over too many, too many things that you're going to do. So if I do, uh, you can let me know. You know, the remain in so the remain in Mexico policy is something that's been in the news lately. Um, a lot of what what we uh, see are people applying for asylum, people that are fleeing um, their home countries. Uh, very often, uh, Central America, the Northern Triangle countries, Honduras, El Salvador, uh, Guatemala, and other places as well, all over the globe. Uh, fleeing horrible violence and uh, horrible uh, persecution based on uh, you know all types of things their sexual orientation uh, their political affiliation uh, speaking out against uh, one group or another and uh, so one thing that, that the, the the government has done uh, that's changed is they've instituted a policy where uh, anyone coming through the southern border um, will have to stay in Mexico uh, if they want to apply for political asylum I'm not sure how that's workable, and this is all very new, because it's hard enough, based on my experience, to have adequate access, you know, to counsel and to evidence and documentary, you know, uh, materials and the things that you really need um, to to go through the, the immigration court system and to apply for asylum properly when you're in the United States. And so, if you're living outside the United States, it's it's it's, it's going to be I don't know how it's going to work. Um, so this this is something that's going through the courts. It's been challenged. And, but in the meantime, uh, it's been rolled out. So it's kind of like at the start of the process now. And from what I'm hearing in the news reports uh, and from people is that um, there's kind of like mini cities that are being built up now along the, um, the Mexican border of people uh, who want to seek political asylum but may not have to stay in Mexico. And I don't know how it's gonna, I, I, I can't imagine that that <coughs> system is gonna remain in place. But that's nevertheless what it is. The other thing is, it, Corresponding to that, the safe third country uh, rule that they came out with, which is, uh, you know, if you, if again, it's, the, it's really the southern border. If you came through another country uh, and you did not apply for political asylum in that country, well, then you're, uh, don't want to use those that acronym, you're uh, totally out of luck. Okay? Um, that's okay. There you go, that's it. So, Again, that's going through the courts right now. Obviously, people coming from, let's say, you know, um, Honduras or El Salvador are going to be passing through. They're all going to be passing through Mexico. And so I think the bottom line is going to say, well, you didn't apply for asylum in Mexico, uh, therefore you can't get asylum here. Um, again, it's going through the courts right now, uh, but the government has rolled that out, and it remains to be seen, uh, you know, how. So a lot of these 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 issues, these policies. Um, regulations and rules that have been put forth by the, uh, by the current administration uh, are being challenged in the court and we really honestly don't know how they're going to pan out so that's that's one of them the other thing is expansion of the um, ex what they call expedited removal so uh, you know it's a fast track way to deport somebody without having to have a judge um, look at their case uh, basically just gives the authority of, a, of, a, of an ICE officer to have them deported uh, it was originally, the original version of uh, expedited removal was, I think, in 96, uh, where they said, well, if you, if you were here for less than 14 days and you were within 100 miles of the border, you're not entitled to go through the, the, uh, to have the, 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 go through the due process of going to court and having a judge look at your case. So the new rule that they came out with recently is, doesn't matter where you are in the United States, but if you cannot prove that you've been here for two years, uh, then that rule is going to apply. No, no right to go to a judge. No right to have uh, any kind of a hearing or anything like that. You're out. Problem with that, of course, is um, how people. First of all, how it, it, I think for practical purposes, it's um, ICE offices now anywhere in the United States. If you look like you could be uh, from another country, exactly what that means. It's, it's really hard to say, but um, then you can be required to kind of. You're going to be stopped, or you're going to, you know, ask to see your papers, kind of thing, and uh, people are going to have to carry around. So I have to advise people now: you have to carry around with you proof that you've been in the United States for two years. Um, it's they never rolled that criteria for it. It's it's, it's, it's it strikes me as being another one of these rules that's going to be very difficult to implement, and I'm not sure really. I, I, I'm sure, but I don't, I don't think that's the way that we, that we, we should go. Um, and I think again, I. Not to get political, but I, I do. From what I see, is 
a lot of these rules, um, sometimes, you know, you, you know, a reasonable person, hey, I, I get it, you know, it's, they, they, they seem to make sense, and I'm going to talk about some more as well, um, and they have some fundamentally, you can say, yeah, okay, I get that, we need to have a strong border, we need to protect, you know, our, our people, I get that, um, but really what they, what they, what I end up seeing them used for are excuses to, um, again, uh, perpetrate a, uh, just make life miserable for, for people and kind of really, really kind of, they're subject to such abuse and, uh, and they are being abused in my, in my experience, um, that that's what they end up doing, so, and I can, I'll go into a few examples of that in a minute. Um, but the expansion of the public charge rule is another another thing that they recently uh, um, put forth. So the entire time I've been practicing for decades, you do have to prove that you're not likely to become a public charge. Okay? Congress makes the law, that's in the law, makes sense to me. Um, basically it has always meant that you, uh, you're not going to end up primarily you know, uh, living with the government. Okay? Um, so what they've done is they've reworded the whole thing and made it pretty much so broad that uh, it's going to be, again, subject to the same type of abuse uh, by the government. So for example, uh, there's several different parts of the rule. But one, one part is um, if you, let's say you, you're trying to immigrate, you're right, you have a US citizen husband, you live in, uh, pick a country, you live in Nigeria, one of the countries that I have some clients from, uh, and you would have to prove to the satisfaction of the consular officer that um, you ha you are going to have health insurance within 30 days of arriving, uh, or otherwise that you have enough money. This is literally like you have enough funds to cover any foreseeable health. I'm trying to get the language right. I could be a little any foreseeable you know um, health issues that you might have. So again, you know I get it. I get the I get the sentiment of it, and okay, it's hard to argue with that. We we want people to come here, not to come here to rely directly on the government, but at the same time, that that, that type of a rule is going to be obviously subject to, um, you know, abuse by the by the officer, and there is no, no appeal or anything like that, so. Um. Again, that's the, well, the, this, the public charge rule was supposed to go into effect on October, I want to say October 15th, mm -hmm. and, uh, but it's again, it's been, it's going through the courts right now, so. Same deal, we're waiting, you know, it's gotta go through the system. Ultimately, a lot of these things end up in the Supreme Court, like DACA is, is where DACA is at, DACA is at right now, and I think the hearing, uh, the oral argument on that is gonna be November 12, but that's, that's the way we're going. Um, okay. So I, I have uh, some examples that I wrote down this morning again. So, so I wanted to talk about uh, CIS, which was traditionally, then traditionally, the good guys. So you have ICE and their enforcement, okay? So they go out and they're raiding and they're, they're, they're enforcing the laws. And, you know, and CIS are the guys that were easier to deal with. They do the adjudications. You submit an application, a petition for your wife, your husband, your child, your parent, um, any type of application. Um, they are now completely on board with this idea of um, let's make life miserable. So, they're rejecting, this is my, what I'm seeing and what I know other attorneys are seeing too, they're rejecting many, many applications and petitions um, for the slightest uh, mistake. You didn't cross your T, you didn't dot your I. So um, recently I had, actually a few days ago, I had two in the last, I'd say, week and a half. One was an uh, asylum application where they kicked it back and said, well, the box, you left the box is blank, you're supposed to put N.A. You know, the, the question that obviously doesn't apply, and I've been doing this for 31 years, and now all of a sudden, you know, this year uh, it's rejected because you didn't put NA in box number 19B, 20C, and all, you know, uh, that type of thing. And it just so happens uh, that the time that I, you know, that I applied for this individual client, and the time that it was kicked back, that period of a year passed, and the law says that if you don't apply for asylum within a year of, of applying, you're barred for the rest of your life, basically applying for asylum, and so it puts me in a very difficult position. <coughs> How do I tell the client that you may be barred for the rest of your life because we didn't put NA on uh, in the box? That type of thing. And there was a, there's another one I had for a, a U visa, which is if you're a victim of a, a certain crimes, mostly domestic violence crimes, you have the opportunity to, to you know, get a visa and get legalize your status here. Um, 
where they, they kicked it back and it was the same thing. You, you have, in this case, six months uh, where you're, you have to get certified first from a, a law enforcement agency. In this case, we, were, we got it certified from Monmouth uh, prosecutor. And the certification, what is that? It's saying that, well, yes, indeed, this person was the victim of a domestic violence crime, and they did help in the prosecution. They helped in the investigation. They, they gave a statement. Perhaps they testified, right? Um, and so they did certify that. And, uh, but it only lasts for six months. So again, when they kicked this form back, I'm trying to remember why they kicked it back. It was sorry, I was, I was bereft when I saw why they kicked it back. Um, it was the same deal, that the, the six months had ran, and so now that certification only lasts for six months expired. So in this case, I'm hoping uh, I can go back to the prosecutor and say, hey, can you recertify this? But nevertheless, if they don't, that person is, is, is out. You know? um, so these are the types of things that we see. Um, not only, you know, you hear about ICE and you hear about uh, the enforcement and the, ups, the, the stepped up aggressivity of enforcement, and these things are well closed. So what you don't hear about is kind of what I call the death by a thousand cuts, which is the, the adjudication grants, the CIS, and what they're doing. Oh, another thing just came to mind, so for example, uh, there is a, the ability to apply for most applicants for a fee waiver. So, and, uh, that I think it's reasonable because the fees have skyrocketed. So, uh, for example, and I was, it's hard to believe that the fees, like, so for a green card, the fee is now like $1,760. Um, everything's just, you know, for a citizenship application, it's $725. Um, very high fees. So they, they have in place, uh, you know, the ability to apply for a fee waiver. And it's not just they don't, you can't just get it, you have to prove. That you, uh, you had your income, and you know you have to set forth your income, your expenses, and show that you indeed you know merit a waiver, and uh, they're just all being denied. Every single one uh, being kicked back, regardless. So the one I had recently, which I don't know whether to laugh or cry, was a man who literally is living in a home in a men's shelter. Um, we had all the proofs. He lost his job. He's working with Seven Eleven due to illness. He's, he's we had a letter from the homeless shelter. We had uh, you know letters attesting to the fact that yes. And this is his income, uh, and you know, just denied. And so the, the beautiful thing for them is they don't have to give. There's very little accountability, so they don't have to explain their reasons. It's just you get it back like it's denied. Okay, so now you lost a couple of months, and you have to tell the person well, that person has to come up with the money, or they cannot apply. Uh, for example, for their work authorization document, whatever it is that they're applying. If you don't have the work authorization document, it leads into a spiral. Of, you know, they, they 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 can't get a job. Right, without a work authorization document. Or if they do, it has to be something, you know, that you don't want, something that when they have to go into the shadows or maybe try to get some kind of a social security, whatever, you know, social security. Um, so it's this kind of self-perpetuating situation that, that we see as well. Um, let me see if I can run through, I can skip some of these things too, because I'm gonna leave some time for questions at the end as well. And I, and I think, um, I'm, I'm very interested in staying as late as you guys want um, and answering uh, any questions as well. The family, again, the family separation, I, I don't think I need to talk about that. That's been well publicized, uh, that situation. I do think that there were about, the last I, 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 I heard was 1,500 more uh, kids that were actually separated than the government initially said. And I think it was around 5,000, is what they're saying now. Uh, and I, they're still working on reuniting uh, a lot of those yep. families. So. They also have lost track of whose child belongs to who. Yes. Um, so at this point, there's just kids that have been orphaned by our government. And uh, there's also just a growing amount of kids that once they're not clean, they're being put up for adoption. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes these adoption shelters are shady. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's a whole system now of kids that are missing and or cannot be identified. As a result of that policy, the government has started to say that they want to uh, DNA test every single person that comes through the border and then add that DNA to the criminal database down the line. So you can make a direct correlation between the time they enter the country and then the time you catch them if they commit a crime which in and of itself is a false narrative. Mm -hmm. uh, immigrants are less likely to commit a crime than native born. Yeah, um, it is not until they're about third generation in that they become on, on par with native borns. Um, and that to me is just logical. If you're here already risking everything and the last thing you want is law enforcement encounter, why would you willingly put yourself in that situation? So 
um, the narrative is simply shifted to make it seem like we have to be afraid of them when we the numbers do not bear it out. The Cato Institute, which is a fairly right-leaning institute themselves, admitted that it is <coughs> in fact true that immigrants actually make communities safer, not more dangerous. So based on that, I'm going to really even go even quicker now, so we can get to to, to um, so. Uh, Reduction of refugees, uh, you know, a few years ago I was at about 100,000 refugees a year that we were admitting, then they reduced it down to, I think it was 45, they reduced it down to 30. This year, fiscal year, it's 18,000, um, uh, the total amount of refugees that, that uh, that's going to be the uh, cutoff. Um, I, I think what I'm really, go, this, I can go through a whole litany and, I, and I'm going to continue a little more, uh, but what it's pointing to is basically, you know, um, it's, the, the current administration is, has a certain um, view of immigration, both legal and uh, what they call illegal. Um, people seeking to legalize the status, people seeking to enter, people who are already here, here and have some form of immigration status, less than a citizenship. Uh, they are, they have a certain agenda, and they are following through with their agenda. And I think that's how I would sum it up. Uh, but then I'm giving you some, some, a few more examples. There's a deliberate slowdown in processing. So things that would take before, uh, for example, you're applying for, well, let's take citizenship. You're applying for citizenship might have taken typically three to six months, easily taking a year or longer now. And it's just, so the trend is also, so it's going, it's going all in that direction. Um, some work authorization cases might have taken three months before, can take uh, nine months or a year to get your work authorization document. And so on and so on. Green card now, you know, I have uh, cases that are pending for close to two years. Um, a U visa, well, that's that went from uh, that's a special case. It's about ten years that I get a U visa, where it was six months, pretty much uh, a few years ago. Not, not not that not really that very long ago. What is that? The U visa is when you is, is getting a visa. You 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 have the ability to get a visa based on being the victim of a, a serious type of a crime. Then they have enumerated a list of crimes, but mostly what you see are the violent, the domestic violence crimes. And they call it if it's committed by someone who's not a citizen. Basically, it's a it's a U visa. If it's if it's someone if the perpetrator is a citizen, it's a VAWA. Okay, and those do go quicker. And and one of the reasons for the U visa uh, is that there's only a ten. They put a ten thousand uh, per year cap on it, and so it just keeps backing up. And, uh, The courts. Um, so, I wanted to title this section. There is there is no such thing as an immigration judge, and and the reason that I wanted to title that is because there is no such thing as an immigration judge, and that's because immigration judges are actually part of the executive branch. So, many people are under a, a misimpression that they are part of the judiciary branch, and they are not. Um, Needless to say, then, so they report to the Attorney General, who is currently Barr, who was uh, Sessions, the guy in between him briefly. Anyway, they report to the Attorney General, who reports to the President. So uh, they're not independent, they are subject to the same political pressures and the same uh, pressures regarding maintaining their job and their income for their family as are ICE officers and uh, everyone else in the executive branch. So I think that's something that needs to be made clear and that as, a, as, a, as a, a immigration attorneys we take for granted, but I think that a large segment of the population don't understand that. And so, yeah, you're gonna get, you know, the, 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 and, and I'm seeing it as a practitioner. So when I, when I have to go into court, immigration court, uh, I'm seeing that the judge is no longer going to necessarily giving me, give me the proper continuance uh, in order to prepare enough time to, to get documents that I need from El Salvador, um, court records from Mexico, that type of thing. Um, so, so it's very important to understand that. And, and there is a movement among some judges, because not, not all the judges, not only ICE officers, and I know a lot of these, several of these people, uh, and that I used to work with, you know, on, the, on that side of the fence, and um, just dealing with them on a regular basis, they're not all happy about it. But nevertheless, they, they, they have to they have to fall in line uh, because again they're, part, they're all part of the executive branch. Um, 
so asylum cases, cases are also being, the asylum law is being rewritten uh, also by the Attorney General who has the power to take cases away from the, the appeals court, the Immigration Appeals Court, which was a very little used device in the past, but is being very, uh, used very often. So just last week, for example, there were two decisions that were issued by the Attorney General in which he said, I'm taking this case away from the Immigration Judge and the Board of Immigration Appeals, and I'm going to decide it. And so all of the decisions are contrary, are, 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 how should we put it, you know, reducing the ability of individuals who are in deportation proceedings to fight their case. So last week there was one of the rulings, for example, uh, uh, concerned uh, what they call the 10-year law. Someone who's been here for 10 years has, uh, can show that they have good moral character, has a qualifying relative, which is generally a minor child who's a citizen. Uh, or a permanent resident or a spouse who's a citizen, that sort of thing, reducing their ability to prove that they have good moral character, okay? Uh, and so on and so forth. So uh, another one has been re uh, reducing the ability of, of, of someone to apply for asylum from, from uh, mostly the Northern Triangle, Triangle countries because of uh, gang violence and, uh, and, uh, or domestic violence. That was pretty much settled law, settled law, certainly as far as domestic violence, and he just changed that and said, no, we're not going to do that anymore. Now, I am characterizing, it's, it's a little more gray than that, but I'm characterizing it um, and trying to get the essence of, of what these decisions have been. So, and, and, and uh, there are over one million cases right now. Over one, yeah, it's just, Gotta get that second. Over one million cases in the immigration court system right now. That's up about four hundred thousand, based on what I've read, since uh, under since the new administration took office. And uh, I, there's an old saying, you know, justice delayed is justice denied. So you know, I go to court now, and I'm getting hearing dates for 2022. So last week I was I was in court, and the judge asked me, you know, are you available on November 15th, you know, 2022? And Sometimes I say, well, if I have a heart attack or I hit the lottery, no. Because otherwise, I guess I will be here and I'm available. You know, um, that's just what it is. And, and that's, that's something that's normalized among immigration attorneys and among people and the individuals who have to deal with it. But I think a lot of people don't understand that either. And one of the reasons is also that bonds, okay, so uh, I've seen dramatic changes in, in bonds. So, so Individuals who are in immigration court, uh, some of which have uh, have gone through the criminal justice system, many of which have not, okay, um, have the right to ask for a bond so that they don't remain incarcerated while they fight their deportation proceedings. In the past, it was very common to see, well, 1,500, 2,500, and it kind of again went up to maybe 5,000, was not like the average. Now, uh, it's very common to see 15,000, 20,000, or no bond at all. So, for example, there's a judge in, in Elizabeth Detention Center where, prior to taking on this role as a community uh, immigration attorney, I was for three years only doing the teen cases in Elizabeth Detention Center, um, where there's, a, there's an immigration court in there. So you turn to the right, you go into the jail, you turn to the left, and it's the court. Um, and she, I, I, she just uh, denied, routinely denies any bond to anyone if they have an allegation. So I, had, I happened to have a client who uh, had a domestic violence dis uh, domestic uh, dispute, and uh, so he was charged with assault, which is typically what happens. I had the wife there in court with me. Um, the judge did not want to listen to the wife and refused to hear any testimony from the wife whatsoever. Was not interested in it, and denied any bond whatsoever, even though it was an allegation. And and, and that it, it struck me because that day I I, I got there early. And uh, I mean, I got there late, and the people, I, so there's a bunch of people before me, and uh, I just watched them basically deny every single bond request, except for one, which he gave 20000 and that was because uh, he had a similar charge, and it was completely dismissed. So, so for that, for him, she gave 20000 And another thing people should know is that, unlike the criminal justice system, where you can put up 10% of the money, you, in immigration, they call it a bond, not bail. Okay, the same thing. Uh, but you must put up 100%. And all yes. of must put up 100%. So when you get a $20,000 bond, you must come up with $20,000 or you are not getting out of jail. All right, something maybe some people don't know. And uh, this is what it is. So I think we're at, the last I read, 52,000 plus and rising um, immigrants who are uh, 
I should rephrase that. I, I, you know, people who are detained or are incarcerated by ICE. Okay. Um, so I'm not talking about for criminal reasons. Okay. So, because I'm sure if you include immigrants in the criminal justice system, so I'm not, I'm not counting those. Just people who are in immigration proceedings and therefore incarcerated by ICE. The last figure that I have is 52,000. Dramatic, dramatically up. Okay. Um, how do I get not? How do I remain non-political in pointing out that? Uh, you can't. Don't worry. Don't worry. So <clears throat> most, I think the last I read again is two thirds of prisons um, that house Im immigrants. Okay. Uh, are run by private corporations. So the two big ones being Core Civic and which used to be called CCA, Corrections Corporation of America, but I think Core Civics, they figured it sounds a little better. So it's called Core Civics. And the other one is Geo Group. Uh, they get paid, I've seen estimates ranging from 140 per, they call it per head or per bed, um, you know, per individual, um, per day. So, when you run the numbers, it's hundreds of millions of dollars uh, that we're talking about on these contracts that these corporations have with the federal government. Um, the last estimate that I read was, um, all right, so in fiscal year 2018, funds appropriated for ICE detention was, is over $3 billion. Now, I kid you not, this is over $3 billion, and uh, it just keeps rising, and so, I have a bent towards, you know, I'll be honest, I have a bent towards, you know, we should reduce uh, government authority. And so this doesn't sit well with me. Um, and, and, and that government, we shouldn't incentivize, everything's about money, okay, I'm, I'm getting political now. And, and I think certain things should not be about money. And uh, that's just why, you know, I think healthcare should not be about money. Um, I think that whether or not someone goes to prison, it should not be incentivized by money. It should be a matter of, you know, a legal, you know, it should be a determination that's determined by an independent judge who can, that, that's not influenced by politics and not influenced by money, who can make a decision. Is this person a threat to the community? Um, uh, is this person a danger to the community? Is this person likely to, uh, to flee uh, or not? And that should be the sole consideration, but it's not. I'm just telling you right now, it's not. Perhaps you already suspected that. The ICE attorneys, so so, the ICE attorneys, of which I used to be one, uh, you used to be able to talk with them and perhaps come to. So the same way in a criminal proceeding, it's very common to have a plea bargain, where you know, it's not always one side or the other. You come to some sort of agreement. Um, it used to be that way with the immigration court as well. No longer, uh, they won't even talk to you anymore. Um, it's just it's just not they, they, they're not willing to talk to you. I, I just had a, a hearing, another hearing that I had, I want to say last week, and uh, we waited two years. It was scheduled from 2017, uh, and it was, it was about a little over two years we waited. And when I got into the court, the you know the, the, the attorney for the government sitting there, and then the judge and the attorney for the government just said, well, we can't find the fingerprints, uh, we can't find the fingerprint checks, so we have to have an adjournment in the hearing. Uh, there's no argument with it. The judge is not going to go against the attorney for the government, and that's that. Um, you know, and then if I want to talk to the attorney, well, maybe we can, instead of going, going for asylum, then for God's sakes, let's just give them uh, withholding, which is which does not lead to a green card, uh, but at least they're allowed to stay here in peace and not be constantly in, in fear and in terror that they can be picked up by immigration. And, you know, um, there's, no, there's no talk. There's no more of that. Uh, there's no prosecutorial discretion. We used to say, listen, you know, so for example, I have a client, we'll call her, we'll call her Maria. Um, she has a son who has severe hemophilia B. Um, she's from, uh, uh, I want to say Honduras. And uh, he's, he's, been, he's a U.S. citizen. He's four years old. He's four now. She also has a daughter who's three. Uh, submitted tons of all kinds of evidence. In the past, she's been given what's called prosecutorial discretion. It means you know, kind of a stay of execution, you know, where, so, so for the sake of our son, and then she's, this, she's, she's the one that's kind of on top of it, and this is a very sensitive, you know, he, he goes to school, she gets called up by the school constantly because if he gets a bruise, 
uh, it could be fatal. It's not like he's not. A, she, she, he can only be a certain distance away from a hospital that has the ability, which which New York Beth is real, or uh, certain you know hospitals around here, and certainly in the city, you know, um, do have that ability um, to deal with. And uh, so the I guess it was about a year ago now we went in and they just said you come back with a one way ticket to Honduras, mm -hmm. uh, no questions asked. And so we had to we pushed back on that. And uh, luckily, uh, with the help of Excel and with the help of uh, you know the advocacy uh, people from certain uh, other uh, organizations, we were able to kind of put that off for now. And I'm filing certain motions and things, but uh, I don't know for how long that's going to last. And every time we go, they put a to come back every month. So every month she has to come back, and it's traumatic. It was traumatic for me because you know, just as the attorney, I can't imagine you know what she has to go through. But yeah, she's a very strong woman, and she. She comes every time, and she just, she's, she's great. She just takes it there with two kids. We wait online for three hours, and they tell you thumbs up or thumbs down. She could be taken into custody at any moment. We don't know. Um, and so, but that's the way it is. It, it's very hard. I mean, to be honest, it's very hard to figure out who they're going to decide to play hardball. You know, and I'm certainly not. Uh, you know, kind of. Yes. Okay. No. My tendency is. You know, to the left, yes, they are. Right? But, but you know, I, I, I think of myself. You know, I grew up in a working class neighborhood in Queens, drove a taxi cab, and you know, uh, I, I mean, I think of myself as somewhat reasonable. Okay, so, but I, I'm telling you that the results that you get, such as these, are no longer making any sense whatsoever. Okay, uh, it's just, it's just completely out of control. And you don't have to believe me, but uh, this, is, this is what I'm experiencing. Um, and so, again, with, with, with Obama, uh, they called him the deporter of chief. He deported a lot of individuals. Um, I believe he deported more individuals than of his administration than the last prior three presidents combined. Um, a lot of people might not realize that either. However, there was a system that he had put in place, which, pro which was a priority system. So, uh, prioritized were people who committed you know, serious crimes, violent crimes, felonies. Second priority, multiple misdemeanors. Next priority, fraud. Until you got down to the average individual who never committed any crime, has been here for 18 years. You know, she's cleaning houses, trash, or working as a dishwasher in Chipotle, whatever. Um, and those people pretty much, you know, were not, didn't feel terror. Okay, and kind of like that, that it's, just, it's okay. You know, um, that's not the case anymore. So with Trump, I don't know if he supported more or less. I suspect it's less. Uh, but those he's, he specifically <coughs> said were eliminating those that priorities, uh, as he is wont to do for all of any Obama, you know, kind of uh, uh, decisions. We know that we're not going to follow that. And so uh, this is this is where we're at. Um, I, I think at this point you've heard enough from me, and you kind of get the gist. So I'm going to turn it over to Itzel, and then we'll hopefully also have time for some questions. So, uh, my name is Itzel, and I'm the Immigrant Rights Organizer for the American French Service Committee. I am a DACA recipient, uh, which means that I am one of the 800,000 students that is currently protected under the executive order that President Obama put forth on June 15 of 2012. Um, I unfortunately do not have a lot of good news either. Uh, one of the main things that has happened in 20, after 2016 is um, I think the most important thing to remember is that regardless, and the actions matter, the tone was set, right? I remember going to bed the day before the election and waking up the next day and just knowing that things had shifted. It's as if there was a referendum that was given that whatever he was saying was okay, right? And again, I'm going to try to stay as non-political as I can about it, but everything that is done, because the executive branch has a longitude of like, ability and power on immigration does come back to the person who is leading the country, right? So the first thing that I'll start off with is there's been a lot of policy changes and as somebody mentioned earlier, my job is to monitor local, state, and federal policy. I try to pick three of the main ones so you guys can have some background because you will hear about these programs in the next coming months. So when you have those conversations or when you see the tidbits on TV to kind of have some understanding of why they're talking about these particular policies. Uh, so the first one is Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. 
as I said, there's 800,000 people that were covered at its peak. Um, just for you to have an idea of who got to be protected under the deferred action. When it was issued in June, you had to be that same day, so June 15, 2012, you had to be physically present in the country. If you were not for whatever reason or could not prove that you were there, that was it. You were out automatically. Um, you had to be under 31 at that time. You had to have come to the U.S. before the age of 16 have continuously resided in the U.S. since June 15th of 2007, and that meant that you had to prove month by month, day by day if you had to, if you were asked to, that you had lived in the country continuously. Um, had entered without inspection, so without any documentation before 2012, um, or if you had any immigration status that it had terminated or expired before 2012. Again, being physically present, it required you to be in school, have graduated high school, obtain a GED, or have been honorably discharged from the Coast Guard or Armed Forces. So, a little bit of background, the country has always used undocumented uh, soldiers for very specific times when the country really needs to have people step forward. So after 9-11, there was a good amount of people that signed up, um, not for the promise of citizenship, it was insinuated that you could perhaps get citizenship out of it, but like many students that I know, it is simply their devotion and their love for this country that made them want to sign up, right? So there is an ongoing controversy now about veterans that were deported after they served and were honorably discharged and are barred from coming back into the country. Fighting your case outside of the U.S. for immigration purposes is nearly impossible and requires a surmountable amount of income and resources that most people don't have in their home countries. And then the last thing is you could not have been convicted of a felony uh, offense, significant misdemeanor, more than three misdemeanors, and did not pose a threat to national security or public safety. And if any of you know, national security could encompass anything and everything, and so it's really down to the discretion of the officer um, to decide whether you are a threat to our national security. And so what has changed? As I said, it was issued as an executive order, which means that it can be undone um, by the next president, by any president really. At its peak, they covered 800,000 recipients and they granted something called advanced parole. Advanced parole uh, means that you can travel out of the country and then come back into the country. And that was a huge thing for a lot of students. Um, and you could do it only for three reasons, humanitarian, professional, or educational, and you have to prove it. So your DACA, I think at the beginning it was like $400 for you to apply just the paperwork. Again, you're 16. Right, $400 is what you gotta pay up. Most of the students were 16 or under 25 at that point. Um, that's if you do it yourself. But as you know, anything that relates to big paperwork, and this is your first encounter, right, coming out to the federal government, means you more than likely should seek legal help. How much a lawyer will charge you goes anywhere from 300 to thousands of dollars. And that is you hoping and praying that that is a legitimate lawyer. In Central Jersey, there is not any provider that actually does a lot of um, nonprofit or pro bono work. We're, I think, the only one in this area. Um, and then there's a lot of private attorneys, but immigration in this area, immigration law, is few in between. You don't have that many options, and the ones that you do have are exorbitant in price. Um, so, again, if you were able to be covered, what it gave you was a social security number. That social security number allowed you then to get a driver's license. And what that meant is that for two years, you were protected from deportation. For two years, you could legally work in the US. And every two years, um, you would resend your applications again. Every time you send your application again, you have to get your biometrics done, you have to do your fingerprints, you have to give up all your information all over again and just trust, that was the promise that we were made as DACA recipients, that the government would not ever use that information against you. So, on the campaign trail, one of the main things that the president spoke about was canceling that program. Uh, there were a lot of people that must have talked to him about all the terrible things that the program meant. Some Republicans refer to it as amnesty, which is not the case, it doesn't give you citizenship, it doesn't give you a pathway to um, residency either. I mean, it's a very limited status. Um, on September 5th, 2017, a year after he came on office, he had Jeff Sessions come out and terminate the program. 
Um, and that would have been the end of the program. I think one of the things that I want to highlight about policy um, as a DACA recipient is how much change people do have to change the policy. On September 6th, so the day after, um, 15 attorney generals sued the United States and the administration for canceling the program, claiming that it would have a devastating effect on the economies. I am proud to say that New Jersey added their attorney general to that and New Jersey was actually one of the leading states in litigating against the administration. Right. Um, on the <coughs> September 7th, six DACA recipients, even though they knew that their status was already at stake, decided to actually sue the federal government and testified against them. And it was because of that lawsuit that DACA is still in effect right now. So the current status of the program, no new people can renew, which means that every year 4,000 undocumented youth are graduating our New Jersey high schools with no path to citizenship. There is 100,000 undocumented youth in New Jersey currently, youth being under 25. Only 22,000 of them have DACA, which means that 88,000 people, young people are roaming the streets with no pathway to citizenship any, anytime soon. Um, the other thing that they did was cancel advanced parole. So to give you an idea of what advanced parole did, um, I was lucky enough to be able to travel with advanced parole. I got a scholarship and was able to go to Mexico for 20 uh, days after 13 years of not being able to travel. Um, it was a social political trip. We went and spoke to legislators in Mexico about the situation in Mexico. Um, we talked amongst ourselves and really built community and we could prove that we were doing work along the way. It was in partnership with the Mexican government. When I returned to the country, I got paroled into the country. Um, what that means is that if, cert if like all the stars align, I could maybe perhaps after many, many years become a citizen. So there was recently an article and the conversation at the beginning was that Jeff Sessions thought that this loophole that could grant only 14,000 DACA recipients have been able to use it, and they are not even at permanent residency yet, um, was a form of amnesty. And so he specifically killed advanced parole for DACA recipients. I will talk about um, TPS and about DED and about uh, asylees who also have access to DAC to advanced parole, but Jeff Sessions specifically killed it for DACA recipients. Um, it currently protects 680,000. So if you see the 120,000 people drop, A, there's a lot of people who after this administration came into effect were afraid to give up their information again. I am no one to judge them if they choose not to do so. I would hope that they renew, but I also understand in a very personal setting why you would be scared to do so. Um, there is no guarantee that they won't use that information and come back and find you or your family, right? So it could be your willingness to share your information that brings the downfall of your entire family. So I don't put that decision on anybody. I don't wish anybody to have that. And the most important thing that you'll be hearing about, on November 12th, the Supreme Court will be hearing uh, oral arguments, not on the constitutionality of DACA, but on the form of which it was terminated. And that matters. Whatever the Supreme Court rules does not mean, though it will get spun that way, that the program was unconstitutional. It simply means that the program was either terminated correctly or it wasn't. But what that means is very severe and how the court finds its way to the decision is crucial. The best case scenario is that the court decides that law, uh, DACA was not terminated properly by the administration and therefore should continue to run with renewals. In the very best case scenario, which nobody's even pondering, is that it would create room for new DACA recipients to, beginning, uh, to begin applying for it. Um, however, that is like a dream case scenario that is not likely to happen. The worst case scenario is that it is ruled that the termination of DACA was done properly and lawfully, that the Supreme Court has the ability to rule on it, and kicks back the termination, the how-to to the federal government, which means we are at their mercy and at their hands, and they will decide whether A, they simply confiscate all our work permits, they simply deny any pending application or renewal, or that they revert to all their expiration dates and you just fall out of status. What happens once you fall out of status? <coughs> no one knows. Um, and then the one thing that I want to highlight, 
before I move on to this is that even in the best case scenario, that does not mean that it will provide a permanent solution to our immigration problem, especially when it comes to young people. Litigation will simply allow the program to either continue or terminate, but it will not put forth a solid, permanent pathway to citizenship for, <clears throat> I don't even remember what the numbers look like at this point, but not for the 88,000 you know, young adults that are in New Jersey growing up here and have spent their whole lives here. It won't do anything for all those other people. And so as much as I hope for a win in the Supreme Court for my own sakes and for everybody's sakes, it still doesn't solve our problem. And so that's important to keep in mind as we go forward. <clears throat> Temporary protective status. So there's a two type of profile scenario. Dreamers are of course, what most people successfully can tell you are people that were brought here young, were undocumented, and then they're all American. And you know, we, we tend to have 86% of Americans tend to believe that they should be a permanent pathway for citizenship for them. Temporary protective status is a different age demographic, but nevertheless still as worthy of protection in this country. They usually skew up above 30, and that's because most of them were given that status as a result of um, armed conflict, so places like El Salvador where civil war breaks out, the U.S. kind of amounts a certain amount of program that allows them to come into the country, live, and work here or natural disasters, so somewhere like the Bahamas where they were just destroyed. They don't have TPS, but it was talked about. So that's the kind of nature of the program. Something really, really bad happens, the U.S. steps up and does something. At its peak, it covered 320,000 people, and there's 13 different <coughs> countries that are actually reflected on under TPS status. Um, I think the one thing that is really important to talk about is how long those people have been here on average, an undocumented person in the U.S. has resided for at least 15 years in the U.S. For TPS recipients, at its like highest, you could have been here legally for 27 years. And so they've been here for many, many, many years. And in 27 years, like you would, they've had kids, built businesses, you know, married people, laid their entire life out here, never had to think about it terminating. But in 2017, it literally was a week. In September of 2017, it was just like everything. It's a domino effect. He took away TPS. He canceled it from El Salvador, Haiti, Honduras, Nepal, Nicaragua, and Sudan. And then he went, those are the bigger countries. And then he moved on to Yemen and pretty much canceled all 13 countries. To give you an idea of why, and this was legitimately the argument, the government was claiming that Syria was safe to go back to for the thousands of Syrian refugees that were protected under it. Like, they legitimately were like, yep, everything's good, you don't need this anymore, you can go back. And different than DACA, where we've been able to kind of appeal for a year at this point, he gave them 12 to 18 months to leave. And so, that was it. You got no other warning, your driver's license is usually tied to your work permit, so whatever time you had, a year was what was given to most countries, that's all there was to it. Um, Salvadorians were actually meant to, like, as a whole, go back to being undocumented as of this January, 2020. Um, two days ago, or yesterday, the federal government said that in a compromise with El Salvador, claiming to be a third, a safe third country to kind of dissuade other people from coming, um, he would give them an extra year. So it's been used as a bargaining chip for a lot of these countries that are not obviously stable and or safe for anybody to live in. What the U.S. has said is if you claim that you are safe, we will let your people who are here in the U.S. stay for another year. And that's problematic because it bars a lot of people from entering. It sets up a false dynamic for them where you can't claim that you are claiming asylum from El Salvador when El Salvador is a safe country. By definition, it creates a lot of legality that just gets in the way. and so. It's been an ongoing discussion between whether those countries that are adding themselves to the safe country list should be doing so, or if this is just another showing of like really how, how powerful we are in, in this side of the, the hemisphere. Um, the pending hearings, so Ramos versus Nielsen is an interesting case. Um, Ramos is actually a 15-year-old girl, U.S.-born citizen, 
whose mom is protected under temporary protective status. And she has become kind of like the face of activism for the TPS community. At 13, she had to step up and learn about her mom's status. And then when she turned 15, she sued the government. And the reason why she sued the government is because she said that she would do everything in her power to not have them take her mom away from her. And so she has testified, she's a powerful speaker. This is their biggest pending litigation. We don't know when it'll make its way up to the higher courts, but if she wins, she would literally be responsible for saving the program a little bit longer. I think one of the most telling things about anything that I'm speaking of today, again, is the narratives of the people that have stepped up to literally seek out justice um, and how young they are. And so the only pending resolution that could even save the program is something called HR 6, which is the Dream and Promise Act. The Dream and Promise Act is by far the most clean version of a Dream Act, which means it just straight up and down tells you and poses the question, do we give a permanent status and a pathway to citizenship to DACA recipients, TPS recipients, and DED recipients? Deferred enforcement is sort of like a TPS, but for a very small group of people. Um, in New Jersey, the last standing Republican in the House was Representative Chris Smith. He is very, very um, sympathetic to the case of TPS. Many people in Red Bank have TPS. If you are from El Salvador, that's more than likely what you're um, protected under. And so he is not too sympathetic about Dreamers for whatever reason, just doesn't sing his tune. Um, and so because they kept using Dreamers and TPS as bargaining chips against each other, there were meetings that were had of a community level of just sitting down as a group collectively. And it was an all or nothing bargain. We either all get citizenship or we all sink with the ship. Um, and that was what was done. And so HR 6 was written in part by undocumented youth. Um, for the first time, they actually brought forth undocumented black youth, which is really, really cool. Uh, there's a lot of intersections in immigration and just like African American rights and just black rights. There's a huge you know, experience of immigration depending on the color of your skin. Um, and so what ended up happening for Representative Smith is that even though we knew that with this current um, Senate majority, there's no bills being put forth, we just wanted, and I say we because again, I am a dreamer and I organize other dreamers. Our thought behind this was, we just want to put it on the record. That we would be willing, we collectively as a house, would be willing to vote up and down on do they deserve to get legalized, yes or no, without allowing any room for Republicans to say, as a trade-off, you let me put more ICE agents on the floor. And we fought tooth and nail. Anytime anybody speaks to me about enforcement, what they're saying is that I deserve something, but my parents should continue to live in fear. And that is not something I'm ever willing to move on. And so we were very specific in the language of the bill. I would encourage you to look at it. It is everything that we would want. It's literally our dream legislation put forth by our voices. And what ended up happening is that some people in this room may remember, we asked people, um, because I organized locally, to call Senator Smith's office. Mm -hmm. There was a rally that was held. The Dreamers Club at Brookdale um, got petitions. And on the night of the vote, I prep, I called them my kids. I prepped my kids and said, you know, Representative Smith said that he was not gonna vote in favor of it the last time that we lobbied his office in DC and in district. So mentally prep yourself to see a no, even though we've worked so hard for a yes. But just, you know, what matters is that we came together, what matters, all these things that you try to do every time um, to like mentally prep them for a no. And to our surprise, I was actually at the library because I am a librarian on the weekends. Um, I got a text message from one of them saying that he had voted yes. So he was one of only seven Republicans in the entire country that bucked the party. How much of an effect we had, I don't know, but we definitely did something, right? We stayed on top of them. And again, this is youth that has oftentimes no documentation and should be the first ones to cower away from our democratic process. But I think to me the most inspiring thing is that time and time again, they prove that democracy still exists in this country. So I want to talk a little bit about 
enforcement. Again, I am by no means fooled to think that the Democratic Party has always been our best ally. The DREAM Act fell short by five votes in 2010 <coughs> by five Democratic votes. Um, the machine that is created now was put in place by both parties, right? Somebody said, I'll give more money to ICE, the next party said, I will too, and then we got $3 billion. So, again, full disclaimer. Um, I dislike them both equally when they do things that I don't like. Um, <laughs> but to give you an idea of what enforcement means, so from 2016 to 2018, so within two years, there was a 44% increase of arrests conducted. And as Lloyd said, there's no priority, so it's a free-for-all. You are caught in a weird situation, they raid your job, doesn't matter if you're a mom, you're a single mom, and you're the only head of household, it's, you're a goner, that's it, that's all there's to it. 10,000 arrests were con um, carried out at large, meaning they were not done in a jail setting, so you didn't commit a crime or were alleged to commit a crime and detained at a jail. It was just like you were walking down the block and something happened and that was it. Um, the removals as a result of ICE detention increased by 46%, which means, again, they're kicking you out. The faster they get you in, the faster they kick you out, the more they like it. The more they like it. There were some substantial changes to enforcement. So because they're more likely to be out on the streets, there's been an increase of encounters between women and ICE. Women have always been thought to be off limits, by, even for enforcement, but not under this administration. There's an increase of encounters between US citizens and ICE. Because again, as Lloyd said, if you look to be undocumented, whatever that means, and you can interpret that whichever way you want, went from 5,000 to 27,000. From 5,000 in 2016, US citizens that had an encounter with ICE to 27,000. You have seen the news of people that spoke Spanish and were immediately assumed to be undocumented. You have heard the news of people that have sometimes mental, um, mental health issues that may have impaired cognitive development. And because they can't say yes or no, they automatically get put into detention. There's lawsuits now pending against, I think one student was held for 22 months in a detention center who was actually a US citizen. There was a student at border communities which have increased you know, um, check-in points and all types of stuff to vet out people who are legally residing or not. And he showed his passport. The officer didn't believe that was his passport. He showed his driver's license. He didn't believe that was his driver's license. So they detained him and took him to a detention center and kept him there until his mom showed up with the birth certificate. And they didn't believe that. And so it wasn't, he was a brown kid is all I'm going to say. It wasn't until a bunch of groups came together and were like, so what does it take for you to understand that he's a citizen? He didn't speak English. Because what people don't understand about migration is that it works both ways. When it gets harder to live here, if you're an undocumented parent, you may move back. And when you move back, you're not gonna leave your child behind. So you may take that child back. Mm -hmm. And I know of a couple of folks who took their kids back, the kid hit 18, realized they're an American citizen and could come back here, and they moved back into the country on their own. Which again, speaks to all the damage that you've said, but whatever, in this kid's case, his parents were able to come back legally and he was a citizen, but he didn't speak English because he wasn't raised here. Mm -hmm. And that was enough for them to detain him for for a couple of weeks. Um, and so that's on the side of the tension. Since I said I monitor statewide and county, um, everything is intertwined. Do not be fooled by the idea that federal policies do not impact local policies. Everything is intertwined when it comes to immigration. Bad local policies, racist local policies, will end in, de in detention. There is no question about it. And anybody who doesn't understand that fails to understand how deeply embedded immigration and criminal and local law deals with. So, in our county, there's something called 287G. Hopefully you guys have seen a lot of the reports that have come out in favor of it and against it. Um, AFSC, again, we are nonpartisan, so we don't go one party over the other, but we do work to end terrible policy. And in this case, the 287G program stems from a section in the Immigration and Nationality Act that's called 287G. And what that means is that um, through the Department of Homeland Security, counties are able to enter formal agreements 
known as Memoranda of Agreements, or MOAs, with state and local police departments. And as a result, law enforcement carry out the functions of federal immigration agents. So again, when people say federal policy has nothing to do with local policy, it is simply not true. The federal government has the ability, and has done so in some places like Alabama, to deputize local law enforcement as immigration officers. And those laws are called the show me your papers laws. As a lady walking down to get some milk, local police enforcement is driving by, you live in Alabama, that's the end for you. He can pull up, he can ask you for ID, he can ask you if you're a citizen, and you can't lie because he can find out. And so when you say no, you are piped into deportation. Um, I can't remember the gentleman's name who came up with this law. He's tried this law in different places, um, and he is now part of the administration. Every single time he brought it into a state level, it got shut down by the, by the Supreme Court like twice. They told him that it was illegal to do that because it leads to, as you can guess, discrimination and racist profiling. Um, but he got a spot at the administration, so he continues to play a lot of background roles in it. I can look up the name in a second. But this is really here for you guys to just kind of look at. There's different types of 287G agreements that a county or a town can enter with. All of these are different depending on the state that you live in, but the one that we have in Monmouth County is called jail enforcement model. And as you can read it, it says deputized officers may interrogate alleged non-citizens who have been arrested on state or local charges and may place immigration detain detainers on inmates through the subject to removal. Um, it doesn't mean they committed a crime. We, I, and some people here have testified in front of the freeholders to try to get them to understand that just because you end up in jail does not mean you actually committed a crime. But that is apparently not something that they understand because what was said to me was, if you're in jail, it's because you're a bad person. So that is their level of understanding. Um, Monmouth County is one of only three counties in New Jersey that has this agreement. A while back, the Attorney General, under Phil Murphy, decided to issue something called the Immigrant Trust Directive. And what the Immigrant Trust Directive said is that there should be a very, very distinguishable role that local law enforcement and state law enforcement should play, and it should not have anything to do with federal law enforcement, uh, immigration enforcement. So pretty much a police officer is just that, a police officer, and they are not immigration. Why would you do such a crazy thing? Because A, it allows you to have trust within the community. If a community is afraid of calling the police, it endangers all of us. If they're not willing to report a crime, it endangers all of us. The case of, um, I forgot her name, the girl that went missing, that I believe she's still missing yeah, from a yes. few months in Bridgetown. So in that case, the local police enforcement went and interviewed the mom, nothing came out, let her go. But because it's a missing child, the FBI got involved. So when the FBI got involved, the mom is undocumented, and now you're talking federal. The rumor in the community ran that the second time they had interviewed um, her partner at that time, that ICE had detained him. That was enough for the entire community to just shut down. Was it true? Didn't matter. The fear was enough for people to back away. And the chief of that town was flipping out against the FBI. Because what he said was, I just care about finding the girl. I don't care who has the clue, what their immigration status is. I just want anyone who knows anything to tell me something. But it goes back into the duality. And so if you haven't read it, if you go to NJ.com and you look up the, op, the uh, editorial that the AG wrote, I think he makes a very persuasive case. Um, of why we need that directive. Our sheriff does not believe that. Our sheriff thinks that it endangers everybody. Um, it's kind of following on a resolution that was put forth by the um, by the freeholders a couple months back, if folks remember, there was a resolution put forth that pretty much said that undocumented immigrants were a threat to Mama County and that there were like a health issue as well. and. I can send you links to the way that they worded it, which thankfully got vetoed, um, tabled, but the sheriff 
decided that he wanted to continue his contract with ICE. So in Monmouth County, prior to the, the directive, if you, again, for whatever reason, made your way onto Freehold Jail, you would automatically be scanned for immigration status. And whether you were um, actually, you had committed the crime or didn't commit the crime, it didn't matter. It moved you from the criminal to the immigration and you were gone. Um, and he, in an unheard move, renewed the contract after the directive was put in. The directive was announced, there was a date, and in between those dates, he put forward a renewal for 10 years. My supervisor has been doing this work forever, and she has, for 17 years, she has never seen a contract renewed for 10 years. And so, it became a showdown between our sheriff, Cape May, and Ocean, and uh, the AG. To give you the quick summary update, because I do want to get to questions, um, the AG doubled down and said, I meant what I said, and I said what I meant. Rip up your contract. Mama County should not have any written agreement between their, um, their, their officers and ICE. Well, he didn't take that kindly. And so he, last time that we went to testify, um, the freeholders were putting forth the resolution and it got passed that Monmouth County is going to be seeking, and this is as of like two weeks ago, is going to be seeking legal counsel to sue against the AG potentially. They're, my understanding and the way that it was said is that they're exploring whether they're gonna enter into a lawsuit or not. Two counties have entered into a lawsuit and so I personally, with everything that I know, feel that Monmouth County will enter into that lawsuit um, there is no point to that lawsuit. 40 people out of 7,000 that went into Monmouth County Jail were undocumented. So to understand a little bit about this, you can either get money from ICE when you do this program or you can pay money to ICE. We don't know what it looks like in Monmouth County because we don't have the documents. So it's a lot of kind of finding out what is going on behind the scenes. I don't know, but all I know is that we are likely to enter into a lawsuit, which is gonna cost taxpayers a lot of money. Um, so keep your eye out for that. And when I mentioned the fact that it was 40 out of 7,000, one of the freeholders said to me that that was a significant enough statistic to continue the program. So I don't know what kind of math they're doing, but I don't think it's, it's the same math that I learned. Um, and so, so last, let me see if I can remember anything. Um, anything else that I may want to mention? Oh, so the Immigrant Trust Directive, because people keep saying it. It does not make New Jersey a sanctuary state. The Immigrant Trust Directive, please. One, there's no such thing as a sanctuary state. Exactly. The directive itself, if people took the time to read it, allows for local law enforcement to aid ICE if a person has committed a first, second, and third degree crime. So if you have committed any of those crimes, you are still gonna get reported. There is no such thing as undocumented people being free from the criminal justice system and getting a free pass on anything. If you commit a crime, you will still be sent over to immigration. It's just a matter of what type of crime should put you into deportation. Shoplifting, should that be the end of you? Traffic tickets, should that be the end of you? Like, it is a matter of what and how much. And I think, if anything, one of the things that I always try to keep into perspective, despite all the things that we're hearing now, and what you heard from Lloyd, is that the damage that has been put forth by this administration in the past three years is so, so deep, and so institutionalized, that it'll take years to undo it if you feel that it should be undone. And so going forward, we, if you are somebody who thinks that this is not who we are as a country, and I don't think this is who we are, you need to pay attention to every single candidate that speaks on immigration. What does it actually mean, what you're saying? Because I've heard from many, just the bad ones, we keep the good ones. How do you sort that out? The devil is in the details. I am extremely critical of any presidential candidate, state, and or local. Because again, Democrats haven't always been our friends, nor have the Republicans. And so, if anybody here is interested in learning what some of the platforms look like and what they actually translate to, I'd be more than happy to have a conversation with you. I also want to put into perspective, because we're doing Trump administration, this current administration, yes, um, just some other things. So what does this mean here locally, right? 
So what it has meant is that, again, myself, it's estimated that there's about 800 DACA recipients in Monmouth County. Um, out of the 4,000, take a guess of how many of those students are graduating our regionals and, and, and other high schools, right? What it meant locally is that many students like myself decided to step out of the shadows and start having conversations face to face with people, right? I am open about my status and there's many risks that come with it. This administration has specifically targeted the loudest voices. There's been ongoing crackdowns on the ones that are fighting against immigration, against detention centers. Look it up, just put immigration activists arrested and you will see a list and most of them are young. Most of them are really, really young. There's a case of a, a boy, his name, they used to nickname him Apache. And he was isolated because he didn't want to give up who the people he was organizing with were. He was less than, I think, 22. And so you have to keep into perspective what this means locally. For me, the purpose and the reason why I'm open about it is because I want to put a face to the immigration debate. It's easy to talk about concepts and theories, but I have yet to have, and hopefully tonight won't be the night, anybody come up to me and tell me that I don't deserve to be here. I would be happy to speak to you about what it means to live in Red Bank, the fact of how much I want to live in Red Bank. If you're asking yourself, does she want to be a citizen? Yes, because uh, there's people that will ask you. I've been in places where people were like, but do they want to stay here? She's, I don't know, I've lived here for 16 years. Kind of seem to like the place. Um, but so but that's what it means locally. Locally, what it means, and what I hope everybody understands, is that there is a growing amount of young people in our towns that are open about their status, that are engaging the community. Um, it is something beautiful to see. And if you're interested in getting involved, please reach out. Uh, we will be doing DACA renewal clinics. I train DACA recipients to learn how to help other DACA recipients renew their permits so they don't have to go through shoddy lawyers. I take students every year to DC to learn how to lobby their legislators, and I try my best to fundraise by all means necessary. And so if you're interested in learning of what immigration looks like locally, there's a array of students that are willing to like openly share their stories with you. And so um, that is it for me, if anybody has any questions. Uh, around if you did not sign it please sign in we want to keep we want to keep an ongoing uh, mailing list for our future programs as Linda mentioned November 20th we'll be showing a documentary yet to be determined and on November 15th our committee which includes Linda myself that's Julie and this is Joe raise your hand and um, our two other members Walter Grayson and DM Jones we're presenting at Monmouth University how to do a community conversation on race. So this is a national conference we're gonna to talk to. We would love to help anybody reproduce this in your own towns, in your library and whatever. Um, the library closes at nine. So we, we try to wrap up our conversation and questions around 8.30 to give you time to still talk before they get booted out. Cause, um, they get a little cranky if we stay late. So um, I see Rosie, is that your name? Yes. And Lori. I don't have a question. I just wanted to make a comment. Um, both of you had said earlier about um, how people were, who were undocumented were targeted. I was undocumented for nine years, and I never, ever would have been targeted. I could have been walking with Ezel. Ezel could be the citizen. I could have been the undocumented. I never, ever would have been targeted. And that's the shame and the unfairness of this whole thing. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to comment on that. Um, I remember years ago, maybe it's not the case, but if uh, someone was not a citizen and they married someone who was a citizen, they immediately became a citizen. Yeah. Yeah. But did they do away with that? I married a citizen and I had my green card and my husband is, is a, a citizen and it still took me two and a half years to get my citizenship. Yeah. 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 So that doesn't exist speak. for the current No, he can, he can definitely speak to that. It's, 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 it's not black and white, it's, it's gray, but uh, essentially as of April 30th, 2001, uh, the law was changed 
uh, and that anyone who did not uh, come in with a with a visa initially, uh, regardless of whether you married a U.S. citizen or not, cannot. It's called adjusting your status. You get your green card in the United States. Um, if you came uh, with a visa and you overstayed for, you gave you six months and you overstayed for 20 years, 25 years, 50. Does it matter? Now, this gets to the point that a lot of this stuff is kind of arbitrary when you look at it. Um, if that's the case, you're good. You follow your papers and you wait your year, year and a half, and you'll get your green card. You have an get your green card. If you came across the border initially, um, it doesn't matter. You can marry your citizen. You, can, you must go back to your country to try to get your, uh, your papers. And the problem with that, of course, is once you leave the country, you're subject to a 10-year bar from ever returning again, and then you need a waiver, and the waivers aren't really granted so much, and all that kind of stuff. You end up. So the effect of it is uh, it's, it's not, it's not going to happen. Uh, so, yeah, so it's not that So that's, that's really where we're at right now. This gentleman and Al. First of all, uh, Hensel, you are a perfect example of why uh, diversity and immigration make us a stronger country. Thank you. So I just wanted to know that. Uh, and I guess this is for the void regarding expedited removal. As you said, uh, that if you're not here two years, uh, you can be removed. Is that correct? But don't, don't, uh, you have the right not to be question unless you're suspected of doing something so well, that's a good work. point that's a good point because see the immigration law is not considered criminal law so all of the safeguards that we think of and that we see we think we take for granted that apply in a criminal context do not apply in immigration so there is no right to an attorney in an immigration court uh, there is no necessarily a right to, to bail there is no um, uh, and so uh, you know what you're talking about like to have a uh, uh, you know, a probable cause that everything doesn't apply in the immigration context necessarily. And so, and, and, in, and certainly in practicality, because after all, uh, number one, you're going to be out of the country, and how are you going to, how are you going to challenge that? It's not going to be easy. And number two, if you end up in, in immigration court, you cannot challenge something because of a lack of probable cause, and all of those things that apply in criminal court, you can't. Which is, look, I don't want to hear that, counsel. I don't want to hear that. You know that doesn't apply. This is not a criminal proceeding. It's a civil proceeding. Mm -hmm. Okay, so so that's something else to bear in mind. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so, so I just wanted, if I could for a second, follow up. Something that itself said actually struck me. Something to the fact that uh, we have to listen to what, what, what it is that actually the words mean. Something to that effect. Mm -hmm. And it struck me that, in a way, immigration law is kind of the canary in the coal mine, I think, of what's happening in this country in a much broader context mm -hmm. is that we're not really listening to what we don't people are throwing around all kinds of terms you know like an immigrant sanctuary city and you know and no one really knows what it means and the people that do really know what it means I don't think have an interest in the people actually knowing what it means mm -hmm. and so it's kind of like the, the the blue team against the red team and uh, it's just that's I think that's what we're at and so I think in a way this issue of being so charged you have so much of that being thrown around these terms sanctuary city people think that you know, oh, oh you, therefore people who commit a crime well, no one who commits a crime regardless the criminal justice system could care less whether you're a documented person or an undocumented person you treat it exactly the same way so I even step back further from what Sel was saying as to whether or not what crimes are going to be reported to immigration okay it, it's no one is saying that because of the the, the your, your ethnicity the race the color you know, you're going to be treated better in the criminal justice system, it's just not, it's, it's ridiculous. Uh, but yet many people would say that, people in my own family, it's sanctuary city. You know, oh, you want to treat them, them better? No, no one is saying to treat them better. And, well, that was our known, that's, that's a whole different thing. We're not going to get political. But I think the point is it's, that, that it struck me that I think in a way that this is kind of the canary to call my thing where I think we all, and I'm probably preaching to convert it, you know, need to really be aware of what's, I think, to me, in a larger context is going on with the polarization in this country and just people kind of talking at each other and using terms that they think they, that has some meaning and really it's, it's not really the meaning that they think it actually has, if it does have any meaning at all. And so, um. Patty, you mentioned in the beginning uh, a statistic about two to one that Americans feel that immigration is good for us. Does that mean, does that include illegal immigration? Or was that survey done on the basis of 
legal immigration? I really don't know. Probably legal immigration, though. Well, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's possible. But right. I really don't know. But I think that the, the my intent of saying that was um, that most Americans feel that immigrants in general um, are good for the country. And right, I think so. And uh, starting principle. with Columbus, everybody's been an immigrant. Yeah. Right? Everybody's an immigrant except for the Native uh, Americans. So the whole conversation is just out of the line. Think, right. The, um, you know, when it came to Trump, uh, he started talking illegal immigration. If there had been no <laughs> illegal immigration, would he have a leg to stand on? No. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, he, he, he doesn't like immigration from certain countries and so on, but he still wouldn't have had a like to stand on if there were no illegal immigration. So it's illegal immigration that's gotten us with this administration, you know, to where it is. But I think the facts bear out differently because he's cut all types of immigration. Mm -hmm. Both, right. First of all, un people crossing the border was way down has been historically now for a long, long time. This new wave of people coming from Central America, our main deterrent and most immigrants in the US that are undocumented are in fact from Mexico, but not so anymore, right? Eventually the table shifted and mm -hmm. just they just stopped coming. Um, but the, the, the facts and the, the policies that he's put in place affect legal migration as well. Asylum is in fact legal migration. You walking up to the border and turning yourself in is legal. So if you want legal migration and you cut it from 110,000 to about 15,000, you don't want migration, period, right? And that is really what the facts have bared out. If you backlog things by a million, you don't actually want people to go through with the process. But it would be interesting whether if he had just said flat out migration, you're right, if he had just said flat out immigration, whether people would feel that type of, of charge to it. Right. But it's important to point out that it's been 17 years since Congress has put forth any type of legislation to fix our, our immigration system. And so if there is any illegal immigration still and illegal migrants, which I don't like to use that word, um, it's because of the lack of work that Congress has put through. Again, on both administrations, the last time we had legislative reform for immigration put through was under uh, uh, Reagan. Mm -hmm. And that's because it was a different party back then, honestly, it feels like. Mm -hmm. um, first, I want to say, it's a, this is the third time I've heard you. Where are you going to be next week? Mm -hmm. <laughs> The other thing that I want to say, every time in you, <laughs> well, all right, I'll <laughs> take a video, I'll watch it. <laughs> all right, but what I do want to say is every time I've seen you, you've always had a group of kids with you, all right, which to me kind of swells my heart because you kids are so needed mm -hmm. on so many levels. Mm -hmm. You have no idea, all right? So whatever it's doing to get you ready mm -hmm. for that journey, soak it all in. But I do want to ask the question of the young people. Okay. Um, okay. Um, I mean, I remember I was a kid, I'd wake up in the morning and my biggest decision, do I wear my plaid skirt with my white shirt and my matching sweater, all right, and my mother's ugly shoes. That was, that was what I remember. You guys wake up sometimes in fear, sometimes knowing something that I, I just I'm just kind of curious you know what what is what is the, the, a day in your life um, any of you um, fear can you just be that happy you know go go lucky let's eat Doritos and orange soda <laughs> you know at 10 o'clock in the morning um, or is it or, or do you actually have that fear of <coughs> something always pending um, yeah. something pretty terrible. I'll give them a second to put it together. I can definitely speak for myself. Um, I think of it every single day. The There's a DACA survey that just came out um, by Professor Tom Wong, and he catalogs just the, like, what do DACA recipients feel and or think on a daily basis, right? And it shows, um, you can see, like, how often do you think about immigration? Every day? every few hours, every hour, almost every 10 minutes. And the numbers are on that almost every 10 minutes. 
I've had and worked with about 40 DACA recipients throughout the county, and I always have that conversation with them. One of the most telling conversations that I've had, I'm not a mom yet, right? But like, you just, there's so many things in your life that you haven't gotten to yet, that haven't been ruined and stained by like your constant anxiety and fear, mm -hmm. that like sometimes when you meet somebody who is that, and is at that stage of their life, you're like, oh my God, I didn't even think that my status was gonna affect mm -hmm. how many kids I wanted to have. Mm -hmm. If I wanna have any kids at all, mm -hmm. if I wanna get married, mm -hmm. right? Like what is the purpose of it? If that can be taken away, can I really expect somebody to put up with that fear? Mm -hmm. I wouldn't wanna, be, like it, all those things, it's a constant thing, but the thing that she told me is, you know how people envision buying a house and like getting married and having kids? And I was like, yeah, yeah. And then she said, well, I think of it, but really quickly come back to reality. And I'm just like, oh, just silly. Wow. Like all that feels like, and she said, I can see it for other people, but I can't physically see myself carrying those things out. So to me, the way I describe it is that you're building your whole life on sand. It's you're building, for me, I'm building this massive sand castle. I've had to do some, and had the privilege of doing crazy things in my life. But it takes one big wave, and then it's over. And so I constantly have to remind myself of like, not feeling defeated, and the only thing for me personally that helps me is the young people. Like my job both drives me insane and keeps me sane, right? Because like, let's get, exactly. We have to remember you're not so old. Yes, I'm 26, but uh, like, to hear students, when I first meet them, talk to me about their dreams, I'm always shocked and awed. I had a student who said, I'm going to be a doctor. And like, when I walked away from that conversation, I really started to think about it, and I was like, damn. You still, you didn't diminish your dreams, you didn't start thinking, oh, that's never, she is like, listen, I'm either gonna live fully or I'm not gonna live at all. If I'm gonna dream, let me dream wild. And she's a year away from graduating from NJIT and hopefully she will find her way into medical school. And so seeing that to me, it's like, man, I can't give up. If they if they don't give up, I, I can't give up. Okay. Anybody here wants to open up about it, by all means. <coughs> I can answer that question, I guess. Um, I'm a data recipient as well, and um, I think it, it is something that you think about like every day, because um, it's always there. Um, but I think that was the best way. Like, um, I have a four-year-old brother, and like I don't know if like you know if something would ever happen to my mom. Um, so, in those times, it's like. Thinking like the best way to defeat that fear, I guess. And um, what I'm thinking is I'm thinking of my, of my brother who's four years old. So, like, um, in my family, we have the um, power of attorney for my brother. Mm -hmm. So, the best way to, like, in this case that I'm thinking is like comfort the fear by being prepared. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, um, in case I would have to become a mother and one day to another, um, we're prepared. So, yes, but it's always there, and I mean, you can just have something strike you and then be unhappy. Mm -hmm. So, we'll take it day by day. Okay. <laughs> I, I like the attitude. Um, that's great. Thank you. Jim, you have uh, yeah, um, I, I would imagine you to know more about the history of this than I do, but uh, it seems to be one thing we, we fail to uh, remember is that uh, people have been crossing the border to pick our crops and to do other work that keeps our food supply uh, inexpensive. And we treat, have treated these people terribly over, over the, what, century and a half, maybe? And um, the same, same token, you know, of, of what's happening to so many people now with this, uh, isn't it also unlawful to hire undocumented? It is, but, but you never hear that about that being uh, enforced. It used to be. I actually started uh, the, the initial program they called Lawyer Sanctions, which was under Reagan, and it took effect in '88. And when I started, I was a, I was a trial attorney for the government, and we used to go out and we used to sanction yeah. the companies. But that's gradually gone by the wayside. And under this administration, I read statistics where basically 
that side is not being enforced at all. Mm -hmm. It's not really a, it's not really a wonder. Of course. And you know, I just want to. There's not not much more you can say, but it struck me. I, I, I you know, you think they were Kurds, you know, at this point, uh, the way they the way they're being treated for coming and picking up crops and helping. Um, and and I just wanted to uh, follow up with uh, what this young man was talking about here. Uh, when you talk about the illegal immigration, I, I think that um, it would it would it would not hurt us if we kind of put into context, and it's a topic for another night, um, why these people are coming here in the first place in, 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 in throngs, and why these people are leaving, uprooting themselves and their homes and their countries and what they would what they would their, their entire lives and making a journey to come to the United States in the first place. And perhaps it might have something to do with policies that this country has pursued in the past. And again, it's a topic for another night, but I think it would help us to temper our instinct of, of, of some of us, you know, to make that separate illegal, you know, uh, you know, if we if we kind of like put maybe maybe thought about that as well, put it in context. Um, Lorraine, um, this is a conversation for another night. Um, the only immigrants <coughs> in the United States don't look like me or like itself. There is a woman sitting here who said that she is an immigrant. How come our only focus, this is a rhetorical question now, how come our only focus is on black and brown people, people from the global majority? I know there are Canadians walking around here that are not Documented. I know there are Russians walking around here. That, so for another night and another time, and please think about this, people. The only immigrants to this country are not those that sneak across the border or come from some Spanish-speaking country. There are other people here. And the United States is not making any noise about them. That's all I'd say about that. No, I think that's an excellent point in, in, in tune with what Lloyd was saying and it's all about what do people mean when they're throwing these words around. Mm -hmm. And we need to think hard about what the dynamics are that are going on in our country and the and embedded racism. And they use, I mean, they always use coded words, right? That's, I think, the one thing that we know, things like overcrowding. Mm -hmm burning, silly things of that sort that you know as a person of color that it doesn't mean that side of town, it means this side of town. It doesn't mean people like that, it means people like this. And so uh, I think the one thing about immigration um, is that it encompasses, and so do other issues, and that's the one thing that I really try to push upon a lot of the students that I work with. This is a collective issue. It intersects with many, many things. The criminal justice, the uh, you know, private prisons, the way that we treat just black people simply based on their skin color. Again, their immigration experience is completely different than somebody that looks like me because there may be some stereotypes about lazy and hard working that then add an extra layer of dangerous and less dangerous. And so I think for me, one thing that I try to, about females, right? So the majority of DACA recipients are in fact females. 66% of the people that are pushing for a lot of this immigration stuff within immigration youth networks are females. And yet it doesn't translate as a woman's movement. And sometimes immigration gets left out of feminist conversations. And so it is a large issue that encompasses and touches on many, 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 many things. Yeah, um, does this, these last couple of comments, I'm thinking back to what you said, Lloyd, about the um, canary in the coal mine. Do you connect the dots for me? Because it's sounding like that's what you meant, that there's a systemic, uh, cultural, historical issue that immigration represents. Say some more about that. Well, it's just my personal point of view. Yeah, I mean, I where we're at in this country, we're in a very bad place where um, the polarization is just so, so horrific that um, no one is really listening and no one wants to listen. And the media, I think, plays a large role in it too. And they just set it up that way. You know, and, and you can, I, I just stopped watching the media because it's just so predictable and everything's yeah. set up the same way. Um, that I think we've reached the point where people are just throwing around terms at each other and 
no one really knows what they're talking about except that it's our team against your team mm -hmm. you know um, and it, it's just, you know it's very easy when it's a concept and it's a lot easier when it's a concept than when it's a human being an individual human being you know to take these hard positions and um, you know it's just, just it's, 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 I feel like we're getting the humanity sucked out of us mm -hmm. and, and the love that we're supposed to when we talk about you know sucked out of us I don't want to get all gooey and everything but um, and I so I do think that that um, the way we're, we're, we're acting towards each other as, as human beings in this nation is really, um, can be really distilled even more to when you're dealing with the immigration issue because it's so much out there as, 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 as to be that canary. And I think how we, if we can come together to some extent on this issue, perhaps we still have a chance. There was a wonderful film some folks here uh, saw last Friday in Pilgrim Baptist Church called Just True justice. True, justice, True justice, right? Is that the name of it? True justice. And it's all about um, the um, uh, death penalty, people, um, innocent people being put on death row, etc. But what he's trying to convey is the bigger issue of justice. And so before we before we wind up tonight, too, I want you to please tell us, you know, what we can leave here with tonight, and and take into our communities and do to promote the justice for not just immigrants but everybody as you said for all of us and Al you have a comment on that. Yeah I got one, uh, one comment and one uh, question. Um, DACA when it was enacted didn't seem to get uh, a lot of opposition and I think that's because it's eminently fair you know seeing things a kid who had nothing to do with coming here but was brought here, and why not give them? You know, how are you gonna? How are you gonna blame them? You know, so you at least give them a pass to uh, to uh, citizenship. And I think people, you know, went along with that. It's just that, you know, I guess the the uh, others who uh, who don't. But that's just a statement. The other thing uh, that I was thinking, and, and you, you know, made a statement. Uh, it's a that um, this is going to be very hard to undo. I said, what if we? What if the uh, next year we get Joe Biden as president. How do you, you know, you could both uh, maybe comment on this. How do you see this situation changing? I don't think much would change. I think there would be there would be a change in tone. Awesome. And I think there would be a change in some of the like most outrageous policies. But somebody like Joe Biden does not strike me as somebody who would want to talk about cutting funding for ICE and CBP. And that is what I'm looking for. I can have a whole different conversation if people are interested in how we fund deportation machine. Like how did we get to $3 billion? Because it wasn't $3 billion. Why does every single time that we come up for budget negotiations, does ICE literally show up and say, sorry, I kind of over, overpaid, overspent, and then government raids places like FEMA, um, uh, other types of agencies and says, well, here's extra money for you to do that. Um, so personally, to me, he doesn't strike me as this revolutionary, like really gonna take us out of the deep, the deep hole. Um, I want to, and I did this presentation at the Thomas T. Fortune, and I'd be happy to have you here as well, um, so there was opposition to DACA, not publicly per se, but privately. And the opposition was, again, from both Democrats and Republicans. Um, the reason why DACA came into effect is because there were literally hunger strikes happening in Democratic and Republican state offices, including Barack Obama's campaign headquarters. There were kids that were there willing to get arrested, willing to get deported, willing to literally starve. And that is how they pushed the president's hand to say, if anything happens, it's on you. And hope and change doesn't align with you got kids starving in your office, right? And so out he came, he could have, the Democrats could have, because they had the numbers, to pass an actual legislation and didn't. Whether that was smart politics, whose fault that is, we can have a whole discussion about it. But Privately, there was a lot of push, and that's sort of the presentation that I did the last time of like, how did we even get to DACA? How does undocumented youth learn to mobilize, learn to push, 
learn to embed their narrative in the subconscious of almost every American. And the way that they did it, and this is to me one of the most beautiful and poetic things about the Dreamer movement, is a direct connection to the civil rights movement. They are nonviolent. What they are challenging on is to acknowledge their humanity. And doing that is the most radical thing to ask for somebody. See me as a human and not a thing, not a party person, not a this, not, no, as a human. Dreamers have taken lessons from the civil rights. They have been inspired by the civil rights. I personally had a life-changing moment when I, heard, when I first heard Martin Luther King talk about the drum major speech and talk about the fact that I could be you know, leading the parade for the biggest house or the biggest car, or I could be leading the parade for justice. And to me, that was like, wow. The idea of justice and equality, to me, is the most American concept there is. And the last, most recent change, you know, push for that came from the civil rights movement. And I've had the pleasure and the honest privilege of getting to meet folks like John Lewis that are just a testament of what can be done when just we come together, right, to fight for that. And so, um, you know, I'd be happy to have a discussion about just all those similarities. We have time for one more comment. I want to tell you that uh, we're recording these sessions in order to post them on the library website. And we have a number of them on the website now. If you go to the uh, Red Bank Library website mm -hmm. under Program Resources, it gives you a ton of resources on this program. Go all the way to the bottom and you can see some of our old uh, programs, including this one. Thank you both for your presentation. Um, when you were introducing the outline of DACA, it didn't sound like you had a ton of love for that program either. Like there's, there were flaws and I know people call it band-aids with never a long-term solution. So I was wondering what is a return, is just a return to the Obama era DACA something that you would like to see or does it need to go further than that? And then also you mentioned and then my, my second part to that is, what is the most realistic scenario that you've seen for a long-term solution? And I think you mentioned one law that was like five votes short. Could yeah. you explain what that was and if that was a good solution? So, HR6 would be, in fact, my dream choice. Um, again, it wouldn't weaponize or use this as <coughs> bargaining chips against our parents and our community at large. Um, and so if HR6 was ever brought to vote, by Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, we could get a fair shake. And I would just like to know where Senator stand, but he's not willing to bring it up to the floor, nor do I have hope that it will be brought up anytime soon. His rationale of it is that the president won't sign it, but crazier things have happened, right? All the president has also been like back and forth on, I love DACA recipients, I don't like them, I do like them, I don't like them. So for all intents and purposes, let's just have a vote down, up and down the line. Um, you're right that I have some issues with the DACA program because I think we deserve better. I think after 17 years, we deserve to know whether this is home and whether people think this should be our home or not because I know for a fact it's my home, right? I do not budge on that. And so the reason why best case scenario is we keep the program is because all the youth that I work with need to know that they at least have two more years to stay here. But all the youth that are not protected under DACA, that is what breaks my heart the most. I have students that are undocumented that missed their deadline to apply for DACA because they were too young, who have siblings who did receive DACA. And as an older sibling, I cannot imagine the guilt that I would feel every single day knowing that they will never know that relief, right? So to me, it is not done and over with until we get, and that's the one thing I will always keep fighting for, a reform for all 11 million undocumented immigrants living in this country. And when I see that, I still don't think that I would hang the hat because there's plenty of other room for improvement, but um, that would be my ideal thing. We need a reform. Um, we can continue to pretend that we don't, but those people are still here and they're not leaving. So tell me, before we end, what are some ideas, what, what can we do when we leave here? So this is what we can do our uh, AFSC plug. We have an immigrant rights program in Red Bank. It's been around for about a year now. We work very closely with uh, local government as well as in my job I get to do a lot more of the, some of the state and then the federal. 
um, Councilwoman Trigiana, who's here today. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> um, And then same thing with uh, Council Councilman Youngstrom. Um, we do work with local government to try to put forward, you know, good policy that would actually be beneficial. Again, it's important to understand that there's the best thing you can do if you want to get a takeaway is vote. Come November 5th, I mean, like, I've literally spent my whole life trying to get the privilege to vote. Please do not waste it. Vote. Vote for people that are, you know, willing to stand up for immigrants. Vote for people that understand the community. Vote for people that are willing to make the changes that need to be made to our immigration system. A lot of the people that eventually get to office, you know this, they don't start middle to high. They start locally. Mm -hmm. So understanding your local politician stances, <laughs> understanding where your government stands. In Red Bank, two years ago, there was the uh, the welcoming and inclusive city. Like, that was such a big moment for Red Bank. Mm -hmm. It was the most crucial moment. I can stem back so much of our energy around organizing to that yes. moment. Mm -hmm. That was the first time that young undocumented people in Red Bank came out and spoke in front of council to say, I am here and please tell me that you acknowledge that and that you know that. Every once in a while you get token measures of like, oh, like, no, that wasn't it. And if anybody thinks otherwise, I challenge you to meet the students who were there that night who can tell you with tears in their eyes that having that resolution put forth meant Red Bank loved you back. That's right. Should vote. The second thing you can always donate to our program because that's this costs money, and the fact that they have me organizing here, here in Red Bank, to me is the the biggest privilege I've ever had the chance. I could go and make change elsewhere, but to do it at home with my neighbors, there's nothing to me that's more special than that. So you can always donate. You can always call your senators. You can call your senators, not the New Jersey ones, but maybe more so the Republican ones, and tell them to bring forth the vote. But local tangible stuff, donate. L allow me to continue to take kids to Washington to lobby, to learn how to fight for themselves, to learn how to advocate for their communities. Um, in New Jersey, you can push for something called universal representation, meaning that there will be money allotted to um, immigrants who are currently detained to actually get access to a lawyer. As he said, you're not given one. So universal representation is something that AFSE pushes for. If you go on the AFSE.org, which is our website, you can click on the profile of issues under immigration, and it'll lay out all the things that we push for and our stance on it. So, and always reach out. If you really want to know how to get involved, reach out. Um, last time I came here was maybe about a year ago? Yeah. I, I don't even. Um, and what came out of that conversation was transformative. We took so many people in that room, and if you don't know the changes that are being that are happening in Red Bank and the way that we're addressing our immigrant neighbors, you should. There's really beautiful things happening in this town, and for all the noise and all the ugliness, there's still light, and you can see it locally, and I think it's important to do so. What's that website? AFSE, so pretty, let me pull it up. Okay. <coughs> Just the initials, AFSE, or if you, go, if you Google you. American Friends, Service, service okay. So, yes. I know last time at the T Fortune House, you also said you could donate mm -hmm. a scholarship for kids to go to school, you know, continue their schooling. Yeah. So, I can also, and if you're if you're somebody that has the ability to donate scholarships or just fund scholarships, um, you know, if you're part of a group of people that pull money together, ask yourself if that scholarship explicitly says or is available for undocumented and DACA recipients. The anxiety that was taken out of me by seeing explicitly you telling me that you wanted me to apply for that scholarship was everything. Again, going back to the things that happen when you have these open conversations, and I'm so thankful that you guys came here tonight. One of the women that was in the audience happens to be somebody who does give out scholarships, and she reached out and said, you know what, I never thought about that. I never thought to ask whether it was explicitly stated. I never thought to care you know whether this was a thing and then she changes that and she's in the process of doing so that's it somebody's gonna get to go to school because somebody thought about is this accessible to somebody that i may have not thought about before so you can definitely do that and again i can plug you into places that you can make a real difference depending on how much time and or effort you're able to put through so we're going to get the 15 minute warning soon uh, when, when they kick us out at nine o'clock please feel free to continue your discussion outside <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.